President Buhari criticizes southern governors on open grazing ban, saying it's a show of power. And APC Southwest leaders condemn speeches of public leaders that promote division. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cole. The ban on open grazing is in the news once again, and this time, President Muhammad Buhari has expressed his intention to address the conflicts of herders and farmers permanently, while also reprimanding the Southern Governors Forum for the ban. The President further accused the governors of politicking uh, with security issues. And also speaking on the ban, the Chairman, Presidential Advisory Committee Against um, Corruption, PACAC, Professor Issei Sege, has taxed the Southern Governors to solidify the resolution on open grazing by asking each state assembly in the South to pass a law banning open grazing in their individual states. Well, joining me to discuss this is Kabir Adamu, a security risk management and intelligence specialist, and Femi Badibu, who is a former Air Vice Marshal. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, great. Um, so let's start with the... Uh, a Saba declaration. I know that you're not a politician, you're a security person. And the first thing, uh, first part of call, of course, is the fact that um, we lost a security chief um, over the weekend. A heavy blow this has dealt to the nation and all security operatives. Even in the midst of fighting uh, a war against terrorism, banditry, kidnapping across the country. Um, as a, as a retired person um, who has worked a, in uh, the Air Force and part of the Armed Forces, what does this mean for us as a country that is facing the type of insecurity that we're facing to lose a service chief? It's a major, it's a major blow um, and something that could take a little while to get over. But because the military and particularly the Air Force have a rule of getting up and going. Um, I can assure you that from Air Force aircraft and air, in fact, the C-130 uh, transport aircraft had to position in Kaduna as early as uh, 8 a.m. on Saturday morning to be able to convey the bodies to uh, Abuja. So the Air Force is back in the air flying. The Army, uh, doing, it has not affected those who are deployed in the operational areas. Um, because there is in the headquarters what's called a chief of policy and plan, who is unofficially the two IT, the uh, present chief. Uh, so all the operations are managed by people on behalf of the chief. And so things are, are moving at least for a little while, and there will be no gap, I can assure you. Uh, in fact, you can see the speed with which the arrangement for the funeral was uh, put together and executed. It shows you that somebody was, taking, was in charge, giving orders, releasing funds, and whatever was required to be done uh, to keep things rolling. Mm. The president yesterday expressed a strong resolve of sorts to address the issue of insecurity and the conflict between the herders and the farmers permanently. Um, but can I say that this sounds very familiar, but uh, the attention, again, is, is, is drawn to how serious the tone of the president is in this particular statement, because Nigerians have heard the president say something like this over and over again. Uh, and compared to other times, why should we take this particular one that the president is saying seriously when we have not really seen anything come up from the previous statements that sound very similar to this? The question is, have we had the president say anything? Because a statement, um, to my mind, is the least that is expected at a time like this. Um, for the morale of the troops in the front, for the, uh, the families of those who lost their lives, and for the uh, Nigerian people as a whole, um, an address would have been more, a personal address would have been more appropriate. 
And when you now talk about all the other issues, uh, such as this issue of open grazing, um, if you dissect the, the politics that he's talking about, um, if it, we, we, we need to think about it properly. There's something that the police call two fighting. Um, it's like two people could be in the peace. But when one person is sitting down and the other one is sitting on the head, uh, if you, I don't think it's the right, I mean, it's not right to call it two fighting. So this issue of summer herder clash or terminology that are being used, when a particular side continues to cover losses, uh, tells you something is wrong. There has been a pattern starting from Adamar State all through the Middle Belt and now creeping into the southern part of southern, southern Nigeria, where the, the friendly Fulani, if I can call them that, who have been grazing in the neighborhood, are continuing to do what they are doing. But there are some renegade forces, and uh, I would like to attribute them to those who have come from the north, who are not real Nigerians, who are perpetrating a, a, a program or, so, or project, so to speak. So they either come and decimate a community or farmland or frighten the, the people so that they can move away. And you come back in a week or two, the so-called friendly Fulani have moved into that area. So it is translating into some form of land grab. And when the president now dangles the issue of open grazing in another formula, where he's talking about those who are interested will be given resources to set up these uh, areas of land. And he even mentioned the fact that schools and health facilities will be provided in those areas. One begins to wonder. Uh, we have the problem of lack of schools in the north. We have the problem of lack of schools and health facilities in areas where people are staying right now. So why is it that this is what he's talking about at this time. I know that this care is not taken because, of course, this is like a carrot and stick issue. Uh, there is a federal government is prepared to release um, substantial forms of money to set up the grazing uh, land. Mm -hmm. uh, if care is not taken, some governors will grab it. And it's not for the good of that people. That's what I can just say now. Okay, I'm going to come back and take you on the issue of open um, grazing. But uh, we're being joined by Kaber Adam, who is uh, a security, uh, security expert. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Kaber. I want to pose the same question I posed to the AVM to you. Um, of course, the president has expressed the fact that he's resolute in putting an end to the herders, farmers crisis and all of the insecurity that we're facing in the country. And I did ask him... Um, why we should take this particular statement seriously when we have had the president make statements like this before and it didn't really result to anything. But then I want to ask further, what must be done for these words that come from the, mis the president or uh, statements from his, the presidency? What must be done to get power, to make these words powerful so that Nigerians can begin to take it seriously? Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, and good evening to um, my co-discussant as well. Uh, so the pre a presidential statement um, can come in the form of a policy uh, directive. It could also come in the form of what we in the intelligence cycle we call a tasking and or uh, a directive to his uh, cabinet ministers, his aides, or uh, the technocrats, as the case may be. Now, that statement would need to be taken up by a number of technocrats and translated into um, actionable directives. Um, in other words, in the form of a letter, as an example, to the National Security Advisor or to any of the uh, government departments that has the responsibility for implementing that directive. Now, usually, there should be some form of monitoring and evaluation mechanism in place to ensure that that directive, once it's translated into perhaps a letter, is being implemented through that uh, monitoring and evaluation mechanism. And I know, as an example, the Ministry of um, Planning um, also plays a role. Sometimes directives like that uh, 
uh, captured as part of um, a guidance to ministries when they are submitting their budgets, they are expected to indicate how those budgetary provisions they are requesting for will meet those aspirations of Mr. President. So um, that statement by Mr. President is just what it is, a statement. What matters is how that statement is translated into these actionable um, items that I've mentioned. Now, unfortunately, you and I do not have the privilege of knowing whether the technocrats that are around Mr. President will take up that statement and um, talk, you know, convert it into these meaningful actions. Now, in the same manner, um, I would take it back to the statement by the southern 17 southern governors. Some of us were a bit uncomfortable by the, the, the statement by the southern governors. In the same way I've um, translated that statement by Mr. President, that's the same way I'm translating the statement by the governors. It is just a statement. And if it's not translated into actionable items by technocrats, in this instance, in the case of the governors, someone needs to take that aspiration, that desire to ban open grazing to the uh, state assemblies to now pass a law that would back that statement. As long as that is not done, then what we are having is mere political statements that are unfortunately inflaming the country, adding to the already very inflamed uh, circumstances that we're in, and just providing, as it were, fodder for those that are, you know, dividing us. And so for me, as a security practitioner, someone who understands national security, I uh, would think that it's high time that our political players, especially political appointees, um, take this debate out of the public space and take it to the platforms that government has provided for that. And a good example is the um, state, state councils and the various security councils. That is the best place where this kind of discussions will be had as against the type of statement that we've seen recent, recently. Um, I just want to push you further because, um, like you said, you do not know, you and I do not really know why the technocrats have not taken the responsibility of making sure that they're actionable. Um, things are done to make sure that this statement is not just a mere statement. But then there are people who have criticized Mr. President for being weak in handling the issue of insecurity uh, in the country uh, or putting the necessary pressure. And as you have said, anything that the president says can just be mere statements. But that's why he has all of those people around him. But if all of those people who are supposed to be working for Mr. President are not doing the bidding of the president and makes it look like the president is weak, doesn't it mean that the president is weak? Does it mean that the presidency is failing? Because never has it been heard that in a time of a situation such as this, that a president would say something, maybe mean it, but then there's nothing to show for that statement or that there is no action that matches that statement. So again, how do you send shock waves through the spines of these terrorists? Of course, it's more like Come on, let's all play here because nobody's doing anything to us, doesn't it? Okay, so um, let, let, let's take a step backward. And I would really appreciate it if you uh, sort of, um, you know, follow my line of argument, um, if it's possible. Um, part of the challenge uh, that I've seen is that as a country, we've been unable to disaggregate this challenge. Um, yes, there are gunmen that are killing people and some of these gunmen are most likely Fulanese. But when the word Fulani herdsmen is used to describe the group that is killing, what has happened is that stigmatization has happened, ethnic profiling has happened, and in the process of doing that, um, you are alienating a significant portion of the population from supporting that idea. As an example, I'm Fulani. And I have never, for instance, carried a gun to commit that act, but I have been grouped as part of that, that activity. And it's wrong. So um, the president, as an example, who understands that um, we have not uh, um, disaggregated this challenge very well, um, one uh, sort of recommendation that I would have given is to start from that. Let's disaggregate the challenges. I have, uh, on my own, been able to iron a consultancy and um, I advise people who operate in endemic areas where these groups are, are active. Uh, example, a good example is Benue, Kasina, Zamfara. These are all places where these guys um, operate. Now, I've been, I, I, I think that we're dealing with three separate issues. 
One of them is the farmer had a violence that Mr. President attempted to address. The second one is the activities of gunmen that we have over time used different terminologies to describe very separate from farmer Hada violence. You, sometimes they are called Fulani herdsmen, sometimes they are called Fulani militias, other times they are called bandits or known gunmen, which is the most recent one. They all mean the same thing, depending on what part of the country you are analyzing the issue. And then the last one is um, organized criminal groups that uh, carry out kidnap for ransom activities. Now, it's very likely that the second group, which is the bandits, also would carry out kidnap for ransom. But there is a separate group that is organized and that is not affiliated with any um, ethnic sort of group and that are just pure criminals. They are in it for the, the money, criminality. Now, why is this disaggregation important? It's very important because each of these issues require a separate solution. If you lump them up together and call them as it were full and herdsmen, then you are not going to find a solution. Even if you ban open grazing, the other two will continue. And so that's my recommendation to the federal government and the state government, separate these issues. And I think it's very important that the media too, as influencers, should also buy into this, um, learn the right words to describe this kind of activities so that in the process, you don't end up um, stig stigmatizing or ethnic profiling that in the long run, unfortunately, would lead to what happened in Ru Rwanda. Okay, I'll come back to you. Let me go back to the retired ABM. Um, the president had very strong words. I'm just picking up from where he stopped. Um, for the southern governors who um, decided that, well, since nothing is being done wholesomely, in their areas they decided that they were going to go on this whole ban on open grazing. Now, it has not obviously resonated with everybody, including Mr. President, who has said that it is a form of politicking and a show of power on the path of these governors because um, they are outrightly banning open grazing. And it's not just the southern governors that are, are the southern governors are not just members of the, the opposition, they're members of even the APC. Um, so I want to push you on something. Can we look at this open grazing situation you know, logically, or maybe even from an academic point of view, can we look at the benefits of ranching in itself? Because when we say we want to ban open grazing, it's one thing, but how educated are people on the benefits of owning a ranch, on what it would do for us if we have, um, you know, cows or cattle that we are milking in a ranch? For example, I'll show you. Um, the Obudu Cattle Ranch is a very good example. The cows that we have reared on that ranch look like cows that you find in a dairy farm somewhere in the UK or in Sweden. Um, so who's educating people on this? Because it looks like, just like Mr. Kaber said, it, it seems like there's a lot of information out there, but they're all muddled up together. What should we be doing to not just put out an outright ban, but how can we educate these people who are, um, you know, herders or people who own cattle to understand the importance of this and if we can nip that in the bud we can now tell who these people are that are coming under the guise of rearing or being herders to cause mayhem or become terrorists of sorts um well you see as far as cattle rearing is nigeria goes i lived more than 20 years in Kano. And so I and, uh, even spent a little time in Yola. So I, I, I interacted with people. I still have a lot of friends up north. And what I got to learn is that a lot of these people in the north and even down, down south, but substantially in the middle of south, uh, invest in cattle. And some of the cattle areas we see do not own the cattle. They're simply managing the cattle for their own. Now, the age-long tradition has been that you do not pay these people a salary. Uh, there's a formula whereby for X number of uh, newborn cattle in a particular uh, group, the cattle area takes one. And so over a number of years, we also have those that belong to him. And if you give him, like, let's say, Let's say a simple number of 20 cattle. Maybe in a couple of years, you could have up to 27 or even 30 something. That multiplication takes place. And 
and he has his own little bit. Now, consider for that whole period, you're not paying a salary, and these people are very honest, and they have delivered extensively over to you. So, you find that there are people in positions of authority who gain from this sort of investment. And they are the ones who, to some extent, will not want to go into capital ranking because now you're talking about um, a different ballgame entirely where they have to now buy feed and uh, pay all, do all kinds of management. It would also throw some of these capital areas out, uh, this, uh, you know, this planning people out of the market. Then you, you find those ones amongst them who hold the capital. And if you recall, um, maybe about 10, 10 years or so ago, we now started to experience the issue of capital rockling, mm -hmm. where some people come to steal your capital and take them away. And because they were coming in armed, violent, coming in from the Niger, from Chad, all these war zone areas, the issue of arming the Fulani came up. And then certain people started to arm them. So instead of the usual stick that some of them will carry on their shoulder, they tried to carry AK-47. Where they came from, that's another issue. And these are the things that have transpired. And as we know, in, um, as some people have said in the last couple of elections, some parties have brought in what I'll call the mercenary Fulani, who are part of the renegade forces from Chad and all these other areas. These guys are not Nigerian. They are very violent. And in the period when I, uh, when I was a commander in Yola in 1998, there was this Northeast Security Committee that involved virtually all the governments in the North, Northeast, and, and of course, federal security agencies, and then some people from Niger and Chad. And what they were into at that time was to try and contain these renegade forces that had been thrown out of position in Chad, who had started drifting through Lake Chad into Nigeria. They were the ones who started to carry out armed banditry along about, uh, what I would call uh, Yola Bauchi Road. And then later they moved all the way to Kaduna Road and to Abuja Road and to Kuntagura Road and so on and so forth. So they have infiltrated the country, like my colleague here said. Uh, either as armed bandits, renegade forces, and people who need to secure money to be able to survive in the, in the, in the bush. These people, they, they, they don't, they're not going to be in town. They're very comfortable in the bush. So they just come into town to get what they need to stay where they are safe. And they found Nigeria very attractive. And so we are dealing with all kinds of people. But my problem here is that right from, uh, right from NASA, uh, what I call from Adama State, there have been areas where these renegade forces sat villages. And the, the town Fulani or the friendly Fulani that are known just simply moved into those villages and settled down. And in a few places, they even renamed the town. Mm -hmm. So this is where the problem comes where one group is benefiting from the disturbance, but continues to say, no, we're not involved in the disturbance. Nobody has pointed out renegade forces that are in the country. Nobody's been arrested. And, um, and you hear from presidency that you learn to live with your neighbors. The neighbors they're talking about are these peace-loving clan huh. who come into town and give you everything. But the trouble still remains when it's going on, they look fairly similar, they speak to full day, or, and so on. So how does the common man know who is attacking? Mm. This is the problem we have. Okay. Uh, finally, back to you, Mr. Kaber. Uh, he's just literally said what you said briefly to us about the fact that we need to, you know, separate the wheat from the shaft. But there's a lot of politicization of this issue, and it makes it, to, it, makes it very difficult to address the core problems like he has named you know these renegades and he's saying nobody has really made an attempt to arrest them and of course the innocent Fulani man who's peace loving um, and not participating in all of these killings has to bear the brunt so 
yes, of course, we uh, have been told to live in, in peace with our neighbors. But if these so-called neighbors are killing people, um, people are unable to go to their farmlands. And governors have decided that, okay, let's start somewhere by banning this. And if you want to rear cattle or you want to continue your business, you need to abide by the state laws, which means that you have to acquire land, pay for this and that. And then that way we know that we have the right people doing the right business and whoever is, you know, doing any hanky panky will face the wrath of the law. So why politicize this issue instead of us going to a round table and sitting together to deal with the problem? I did t interview somebody last week and the person said that all our politicians know the right thing to do, but they refuse to do it because it benefits them. Do you agree with that? I agree totally. I, I don't know who that person is, but I would, I'm defending him a high five wherever he is. I mentioned earlier on that um, our politicians need to take this debate away from the public space uh, into the platforms that government have provided for this type of issues. This debate is not in any way helping our national unity. Um, during our 60th uh, Jubilee and, um, celebrations, we celebrated togetherness. Um, how can we be together when this is dividing us, really? Um, certain politicians from different parts of the country uh, who have national aspirations are finding it very difficult to come out with a common position on this issue. Because again, like I said, um, if you send a message that is appearing to uh, advocate for ethnic profiling, or for stigmatization, you are alienating a significant portion of the population. And so not every politician would want to do that, especially if he has national aspirations. However, if your aspirations is at the state level and you want to champion a cause that uh, your state appears to um, embrace, which is to ban open grazing, then again, like I said, um, don't do it um, politically. Do the right thing. Um, send um, a bill, as an example, to the state assembly. A good example is Benue State and Taraba State. Um, despite the controversies surrounding what they did, they've done it, and it has stood the test of time. So what is the essence of coming out in the public and saying you're banning open grazing without actually um, you know, going through the process of banning open gra grazing? All you would have succeeded in doing is generating tension. So very political, that's number one. Number two, it's also very difficult um, for the federal, federal government, as an example, to come up with a statement on this issue because the way the, the issue was generated, remember, uh, time will not allow us, but if we are going to trace the genealogy of this uh, discussion, you would have found out that at, the, at some time, the media was using the term Fulani Hartsman. And then it changed from Fulani, Fulani herdsmen to maybe just herdsmen, and then to um, Fulani militia, and then name it. It has gone through a range. So making it very difficult for a politician at the federal level to take a decision, because by the time he, he or she takes that decision, uh, a particular segment of the country would um, feel he has shortchanged them or be against them. So okay. I think the way to go, like I said, number one, remove the debate from the public space. Enough of our politicians fighting each other or mobilizing along ethnic or regional or, or religious um, lines. It's not, it's not going to augur well for our national unity. So remove that from the public space. Let them take it to the platforms that government have provided for this type of discussion. Um, it's in our constitution. The state councils, there are several state councils uh, through which this kind of discussions can be held. Okay. If we continue to take this discussion in public space, unfortunately, the consequences will not be very well for us. Now, the well, second point... We have this. to go. I'm so sorry, but we have to go. Unfortunately, time is not on our side, but Kabir, Kabir Adamu, um, Air Vice, former Air Vice Marshal, uh, Femi Badibu, thank you very much for being part of this conversation. We wish you could go on. Thank you for having us. All right. Well, we'll uh, take a short break. Thank you for staying with us. When we return, APC Southwest leaders condemn discourses of leaders that stimulate division. We'll be right back. <laughs>